When it comes to the navies of neutral powers, there is often not a huge amount to talk about. They're certainly still worth covering, because ships like the South American Dreadnoughts or the Swedish coastal defense ships are fascinating. For all of that, though, they usually don't do much beyond patrol home waters or visit foreign ports. The Swedish Navy is a classic case here, as they haven't seen a war since before the Ironclad Revolution. Yet they've built some incredibly interesting warships that are worth looking at. So long as you go in knowing, they don't really have big combat victories. Today's video will cover one such vessel, the one that had the chance to truly impact history outside Sweden. That being the aviation cruiser Gotland, perhaps most famous for being the ship that spotted Bismarck on her fateful mission. The origin of Gotland can be traced back to a need to modernize the Swedish fleet. In the 1920s, this was an aging force, with only one cruiser that could charitably be considered modern. And that was an armored cruiser dating back to 1907, that at the point we're talking about, hadn't even been modernized yet. While an admittedly capable armored cruiser, that still didn't inspire much confidence in Swedish command circles. The rest of their navy consisted of a mix of outdated coastal defense ships, some similarly old destroyers, and three modern coastal defense ships just then entering service. As such, and with weapons technology advancing at a rapid pace, the Swedes needed new ships. They wanted mine layers. They wanted seaplane carriers. They wanted modern cruisers. Really, they wanted an entirely new core to their fleet, to support those fancy new coastal defense ships. This was perhaps a tad optimistic considering funding realities, so the Swedish Navy would have to settle with less than they wanted. Around 1926, they had a proposal put forward for a seaplane carrier. From what I've been able to find, this would have carried 12 aircraft, launched by two catapults, but they would have had to land on the water to be brought back aboard. The ship was armed with six 152mm 6-inch guns, four 75mm anti-aircraft guns, and a further eight 40mm guns, along with the ability to load and lay mines. Meanwhile, her speed would have been 27 knots. An ambitious design to be sure, especially for the time and the Navy looking at it. A bit too ambitious, really, as the Swedish Navy ended up rejecting the ship. This was for a number of reasons, ranging from concerns about seakeeping to the arrangement of the main battery, only allowing for a three-gun broadside. Toss in that seaplanes were becoming hardy enough that they could be stored outside a hangar, and the full hangar idea was abandoned. Instead, the seaplanes and their accompanying equipment could be carried on the stern, while the rest of the hull could be freed up for mounting proper turrets to carry the same six 152mm guns. Or so the initial idea went, though some bright spark came up with the idea of just combining every role Sweden wanted a new ship for, into one crowded design. So the Swedes ended up rejecting the seaplane carrier for a cruiser that, in order, had to carry and operate a number of seaplanes, had to be capable of fighting other cruisers with turret-mounted 152mm guns, had to be capable of leading destroyer formations, and finally, had to be able to act as a mine layer. All of this was expected on a displacement of 5,000 or so tons. If this aircraft cruiser, I am not even going to try to butcher the Swedish designation, seems even more ambitious than the original design, you aren't wrong. This design graduated to carrying eight seaplanes on her stern, along with two triple torpedo tubes and the mine laying equipment. The main battery was now carried in three twin turrets, one behind the superstructure, and the remaining pair superfiring on the bow. A speed of 29 knots was now intended for the ship. As it would turn out though, even with this ambitious design, the Swedish Navy pressed forward until it actually reached the yard expected to build it, and was promptly noted as being too expensive for the amount of funds the Navy was able to scrounge up. As such, it went back to the drawing board. She was shortened by 10 meters, 33 feet, and lost one of her bow turrets. She didn't lose the two guns, though, as the spare 152mm guns were mounted in a single casement on either side of her superstructure instead. Somewhat like the Omaha class over in the United States, but with less guns. Further weight savings came in deleting one of the two catapults in favor of just carrying one. 
as well as lowering her installed power, which by extension lowered the speed to 27.5 knots. Through this, the cruiser was lowered down to 4,600 tons on her normal loading, which made it possible to actually build her. After this long and winding development process, the construction finally began in 1930. At this point, the cruiser had picked up her name, Gotland, and was finally moving forward. Her final design, as mentioned, displaced 4,600 tons on standard loading. This allowed her to carry six 152mm guns in two twin turrets and the aforementioned pair of casements. Anti-aircraft defenses consisted of four 75mm cannon, with two in a smaller twin mounting superfiring over the stern turrets, and the other two in single mountings on either side of the ship between the funnels. Her smaller anti-aircraft guns were four 25mm guns around the superstructure, and all of these were, as you could expect since this is Sweden, made by Bofors. Rounding out her offensive weaponry were two triple torpedo tubes, one on either side of the ship. As for her mine laying capability, this would be fairly tacked on in the end. A pair of short rails mounted to her stern around all of the aviation equipment. And on the subject of her aviation equipment, Gotland could, theoretically, carry up to 11 aircraft if the catapult was locked in place. As it would turn out, she only ever carried 6 aircraft, because Sweden was unable to acquire more than 6 Hawker Osprey Scouts, because Britain stopped building them when Sweden was trying to buy them. As could be expected, with all this equipment shoved onto a ship with such a small hull, Gotland had... well. Her armor is best described as hopes and dreams, since the armor only reached a maximum belt thickness of 24 millimeters, or chest shy of an inch. The rest of her armor was really splinter protection at absolute best. With all of that done and out of the way, we can move to her service history, such as it is. Gotland entered the water on September 14th, 1933, and commissioned into the Swedish fleet on December 14th, 1934. Unsurprisingly, her interwar career was a quiet one. She would patrol Swedish home waters, go on training cruises, and generally just sail around, doing not much of note. This isn't to say she was useless or anything like that. Simply that, in common with most ships in this period, there wasn't much for her to do. This goes double for Sweden, with the long-held neutrality and all of that. About the most exciting things to happen to her were a couple visits ranging as far as South America and West Africa. For a Scandinavian warship, that's actually quite the long journey, and the kind that the coastal defense ships would have struggled with. On the subject of struggling with things, though, the Ospreys ended up proving to be rather fragile in actual service conditions, to the point that the old design, with an enclosed hangar, would probably have been superior for operating those aircraft. Gotland would, more than once, have to return to port to fix her aircraft up. That aside, as the interwar period ended and the Second World War began, less changed for Gotland than you might think. Sweden managed to remain neutral for the entirety of the war, though they did have to tread carefully to maintain that. Part of that was keeping their fleet up and running, and warily watching the Germans to make sure they didn't get any ideas. So for the early part of the war, Gotland would patrol Swedish waters to enforce that neutrality. It was on one of those patrols, in May 1941, that Gotland would receive her moment of fame. The battleship Bismarck and the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen were spotted by Swedish reconnaissance aircraft, setting out on their famous voyage. Gotland would spot them herself as they sailed between Sweden and Denmark. Gotland proceeded to shadow the German formation for two hours, in addition to sending a report to Swedish naval headquarters. This report was promptly leaked to the British in Sweden, at which point it went to Britain. And thus was Bismarck's voyage confirmed, with the addition of other data in Britain. As this is beyond the scope of this video, though, let's return to Gotland. The mid-war years, 1942 and 1943, were uneventful. She continued her neutrality patrols and training duty, with little excitement to speak of. However, the cruiser was starting to show her age. Her speed was considered too slow for Sweden's new plans of two fast cruiser task forces. And more importantly, her aircraft were less than ideal. 
already obsolescent when delivered, they were fully obsolete by the mid-1940s. With no real replacements to hand, and modifications to launch better aircraft considered too expensive, Godland went in for a refit in 1944. This removed her old biplanes, though not the deck they had been stored upon. This was, instead, converted to an anti-aircraft platform, mounting four twin 40mm Bofors mounts, along with four 20mm cannon in two twin mounts. This breathed new life into the old cruiser, though even this was something of a stopgap measure to keep the hull in service. After the war ended, Gotland continued on the same duties she always had, with the exception that she was now more of a training ship than an actual warship. She would still go on voyages as far afield as South Africa, but she was no longer the most advanced Swedish vessel. The cruiser was, in fact, wearing out. By 1952, Gotland could barely make 25 knots on a good day, with her power plant showing its age. As a result, the Swedes pulled her in for another refit and conversion. In 1953, she was turned into a fighter direction ship by the fitting of radar and direction equipment. The refit concluded the following year, in 1954. This was on the off chance she was needed in an active conflict, though her actual role remained training duties. She remained doing such for a couple more years, but by 1956, the Swedish Navy decided she was surplus to requirements, Refit or no refit. Gotland was decommissioned at that point, and pulled off the naval register in 1960. The old cruiser was finally scrapped in 1963. She may not have done much of note, Bismarck sighting aside, but for a neutral navy like Sweden, well, that was perfectly fine. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you in the next one.